At one time or another, we have all dreamt of hitting a home run to win an important game. It takes practice and certain fundamental hitting knowledge and skills to get into the situation where we become the game hero. Hello, my name's Dave Gorey. Over the years, it's been my great desire to demonstrate that hitting skills can be improved. This video and manual are designed to help the coaches and players achieve their potential. Section one, safety first. No video dealing with hitting should ignore the fear factor. No one wants to be hit by the ball. As a matter of fact, many youngsters have had their careers ended prematurely by just such a fear. Now, good technique allows for safety for the hitter, and safety is best achieved by the hitter who can maintain his balance, whose motions are controlled and fluid, and who can bob and weave and turn away. Specifically, the hitter in the most jeopardy is the one who opens his upper body too early and exposes his face and his chest to the ball. The safest hitter is the one who can keep his shoulder in a straight line or even turned a little bit and wait until the very last split second to rotate. Now, practicing with tennis balls or other safe, soft type of ball is an effective way of reducing the fear factor. No young player should go without the proper training and the art of avoiding the pitch. We should be grateful for helmets and other type of protective equipment, but also grateful to coaches who train their players to protect themselves. The successful coach is able to communicate his technical knowledge. Now here are some teaching principles. Section two, teaching principles and vocabulary. Don't change the hitter who does not need to be changed. What you're seeking to achieve anyway is naturalness and fluid motions. You don't want to be mechanical. So, as the old adage says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't over-verbalize means just don't say more than you have to say. Keep it simple. It's much easier to understand, and, and after all, you are seeking understanding from the player. He's not just somebody who's soaking up information. He's somebody who you hope is understanding. Work with principles, that is, motions that lead to other good motions, things that happen that make other things happen. Now, the hitter must understand these things. For him to be as, as good as he's going to be, he has to understand it as well as you understand it. Relaxation and concentration are skills to be practiced. And what we want to avoid is wild swinging and meaningless practice. Because what we do in a game is what we do in practice. So I want to make sure that the quality of the relaxation and the concentration is there. Quality of practice. Never take the practice beyond the point where he can practice properly. If the hitter has more repetitions than he can handle, then he's etching the wrong things into his nervous system. So make sure that when he's practicing that he never goes beyond the point where he can concentrate and do the proper things time after time. As skills improve, then you can start working with smaller muscle groups. But early in the learning process, work with larger muscle groups. Fine tune as the player begins to understand and things become much more natural. Coaches should stay positive in their comments to players. The only thing that the coach should criticize is work habits, because the player has to be full of optimism and hope for the future and all of the things that keep him enthused and wanting to be a better hitter. So don't create a barrier between yourself and the player. One-on-one -on -one teaching is valuable. I would take every opportunity I could to take one player with one coach and teach him so that I might deal with him personally, because everybody has problems that are his alone. Now, I know that I'm making progress, or the coaches know that he's making progress when the players start using a common language. Now, here's some word and word pictures that we use that are very valuable towards visualizing the things that we want to do. Be moving. Movements which lead to other movements. Overcoming inertia. Relax. It lowers the center of gravity, promotes rhythm, actually enhances power, and relieves tension, the enemy of the hitter. Ready early, a means by which you can give yourself valuable time as a hitter. See the ball. 
a direct visual angle to the ball. A hitter sees the ball as much like a catcher sees it as possible. Flow, a fluid motion into the approach. Not jerky, not jumpy, but fluid, smooth. Keeping the ball in front of you means several things. First is the visual angle, the direct visual angle, which we had talked about. Secondly is the out front target that we have. We're not going to let the ball get by the out front target. And three is the weight shift that we find in the swing. Staying back means that while in a controlled approach, I'll hold the swing back until the very last instant. Looking down on the ball. This is where the strike zone is. And also, the body will follow the head. Section three, the hitter's mind. Most of us are told that hitting a baseball is the most difficult thing to do in sports. Well, maybe it is. I doubt, however, if Ted Williams or Henry Aaron felt that it was an impossible thing to do. Difficult, perhaps, but certainly not impossible. The great Stan Musial was asked one time if he ever felt like he was going to go four for four. And he said, all the time. So what Stan Musial and Henry Aaron and Ted Williams and other great hitters do or did was that they had predicted success for themselves. They could see themselves succeeding. There was no problem. There was no negative influence in their minds. And this is the type of thing that we must try to put over to our athletes, to our hitters. Because mental imagery, imagination, the proper use of one's imagination is perhaps the most important force in the improvement of a hitter, other than just going out and, and swinging the bat on the field. Because really what happens is that the, the nervous system can't tell the difference between something that's vividly imagined and something that's actually happened. The difference is that when we vividly imagine something, we can imagine what we want to imagine. We can imagine ourselves hitting the ball properly, making adjustments to curve balls and so forth. We can imagine doing what we're doing and we are reinforcing the proper actions in our minds. So we are giving ourselves a great deal more practice of the right things and in the right way. Now wishful thinking is really not a part of this. In other words, I'm not wishing, I am actually believing and seeing and feeling all of the things that go along with becoming a better hitter. So that the physical things that I practice and the mental things that I practice go hand in hand and my confidence grows and as my confidence grows, my prediction of success grows with it. So the two go hand in hand. Now, in order to be a great hitter, you have to concentrate. Now, what is concentration? Well, I guess you might ask what it isn't. Because you can't say to somebody, concentrate, because what does that mean? It can mean a lot of things, but what it really should mean is that I am able to restrict my focus on one item at a time. One item. In the case of hitting, it's see the ball and hit the ball. Now, distractions take my range of vision from a narrow focus to a wide focus. And the mind and the eyes are tied together as a unit. And when my mind wanders, my eyes wander. And this is what you call distraction, because I'm, I'm being taken away from this narrow focus. Now, what kind of distractions are we talking about? Well, how about the coach who keeps shouting physical instructions at his player? Keep your hands high or do this with your feet or what have you. He can't think of his feet and the ball at the same time. How about trying to please your mom and dad or your girlfriend and do all, so your mind is on them and what they're going to think if you do or don't? That forces the wide vision of your eyes. How about thinking of having to get a base hit? How about thinking of having to get an RBI or a long ball? Now you're no longer thinking about the ball, you're thinking about these results. So you have to be oriented towards the task and not the results, because the results can be a distraction. How about trying hard? Trying too hard, because it means a lot. How about trying easier? How about relaxing? How about allowing your body to work and avoid distractions? Now, in any physical skill, you're going to have three different aspects. Now, we talk a lot about imagination. We talk about use of the imagery and imagination, but there is a place where we have to think with the rational mind. And that is to analyze it is what we're going to do. As I go to the plate, 
I analyze what it is I'm to do. Or maybe the coach tells me what I'm supposed to do, hit the ball to the right side or bunt or what have you. That's the end of my rational thinking. From there on, it's imagination. I think about what I'm to do, and then I imagine myself from the inside. I imagine myself, I am the camera, seeing the ball and hitting the ball. And I imagine this coming to a successful conclusion. When I step up to the plate and I'm focused narrowly on the ball and I have rehearsed what I, what I have to do, my chances of executing what I have planned are much greater than if I didn't do it in this way. Part of this getting the job done is to think that I'm going to have limited goals. I mean, I don't want to have all these grandiose things. I want to have a limited goal because the more limited my goal, the more narrow my range of vision is, which is very important. And that has a whole lot to do with see the ball and hit the ball. The vision probably should be correlated with getting meaning out of what one sees. Because eyesight is only one aspect of being a hitter. I have to not only see it, but I have to process information. And if I'm relaxed and I have a narrow range of vision and I'm concentrating well, allowing no distractions, I'm going to be able to correlate vision with meaning of what I see. The hitter's job is not to get a hit, to hit a home run, or to drive in a run. These aren't jobs. These are results of jobs well done. His only task is to see the ball and hit it. And he can't let results get in the way of his concentration on the job that he is to do. Now, this is a difficult lesson for sure, but absolutely essential. Section 4, learning how to hit. The relaxed, controlled swing is important. The hitter's job is to see the ball and hit the ball. He's relaxed, he's balanced, he's not afraid of the ball. The coach's task is to convince the player that if he really wants to be better, to hit for a better average, hit with power, strike out less, pop up less, hit in the clutch, hit better pitchers, then he has to swing with the amount of force necessary for perfect efficiency. Tactics are dependent upon this efficiency, but it doesn't diminish power, and here's why. Swinging too hard means swinging too early with the hands depriving the hitter of the time needed to swing with the big muscles of the body and allow a good weight shift. When the hitter is under control, he sees the ball. He derives meaning out of what he sees. Swinging within oneself means relaxation and rhythm. When the ball is in the ideal position in the strike zone, the hitter will automatically swing a little harder but it will be done at the right time and in sync. Section five, what is a good swing? All good hitters have five things in common, five things that each does consistently well. All good hitters are able to keep their head and eyes in a position to see the ball very well from the time it's released until it gets into their strike zone. Now it's critical that you keep the head and eyes in this position because you can't hit what you can't see. And in addition, the head being at the top of the axis will dictate your body posture. So keeping your head and eyes in position and the eyes right on the ball is critical. The stride will always be to the same spot regardless of the pitch. This means that adjustment to the variety of pitches is not made with the stride, but after the stride has occurred. As the swing begins, the hands stay back over the rear foot. This means that the swing does not begin with the hands, but begins with the feet, upper body, and finally with the hands. The center of gravity remains stable throughout the swing. And remember, it's impossible to have good athletic posture if you don't keep your head in good position. The back shoulder follows the flight of the batted ball. A weight shift definitely occurs. The coach's task is to teach techniques which allow these five characteristics to happen. This is learning how to swing, and although the swing can be highly technical, in essence and simply put, it has three major phases, the stance, the approach, and the swing itself. Section six, learning how to swing. Learning how to use a good swing in competition is hitting. Good tactics then depend to a great extent upon technique. Let's begin the process of becoming a good hitter by discussing the elements of a swing and the techniques involved. 
The grip achieves maximum efficiency of the hands and arms. Mild pressure comes only from the bottom three fingers of each hand. The feet are placed shoulder width or less apart, square to the pitcher in his stretch position, close enough together to allow for forward motion. With the bat resting on the shoulder and the body erect, merely tilt the body from the waist until the toes grab the ground, then soften the knees and roll them in slightly. The bat is placed in a position where the hands are at the top of the strike zone and over the back foot. The arms are relaxed. The lead arm is close to the body and bent at about a 90 degree angle. The back elbow is reasonably away from the body. See the ball like a catcher sees it with eyes close to level. This also has a positive effect on body posture. Though the pitcher is not yet ready to pitch, the hitter needs to stay relaxed and rhythmic. The pendulum begins motion which will continue in one form or another until the swing is completed. Swing the bat to position and keep motion going by gentle movement of the center forward and back. As the pitcher draws his hand back to throw, the hitter reduces the movement of his center and brings it gently back and practically to a stop. This will transfer weight to the inside of the back foot in preparation for the move forward. As the pitcher's hand moves toward the hitter, the hitter begins his movement forward. This can be described as a rolling start into the pitched ball. This movement begins the shifting of the entire center forward and facilitates the stride. Upon release of the ball, the hitter puts his front foot down. The head is centered, equal weight on each foot, equal bend at the knees. The upper body remains turned, keeping the bat back. The hitter achieves a strong, balanced position with energy stored in the legs. Even though the center of gravity is stabilized, movement continues as the back foot pushes against the strong front foot and leg. The upper body remains turned back as the back foot and knee roll forward, forcing the back hip to turn. The strong front leg will not allow the front side to collapse, open, or change the center of gravity. The batter attacks the ball using the ground as a counterforce to his feet. He pivots his hips forcefully and quickly. The upper body will respond by turning from the back side. The arms remain close to the body. Centrifugal force starts the swing. The top hand completes the swing as the bat flies to a bridge position. The head and eyes are fixed to the contact position. Hips, shoulders, and bat are parallel and 90 degrees to the line of flight. The hands are bridged. Palm up, palm down. The lead leg is strong. The front foot remains planted strongly and closed to the line of flight. The follow through has taken the hands to the opposite shoulder. The back side is completely pivoted, which allows for an efficient first step with the back foot toward first base. In review, let's go through the sequence of the swing. After the hitter establishes a good solid base, he begins motion with the pendulum swing for relaxation and rhythm. Then he continues small movements as he awaits the pitcher's delivery. As the pitcher's hand comes toward him, he pushes forward. His foot comes down upon release of the ball. Torque is developed as the hips open and shoulders stay back. The swing is a release of energy, legs, torso, shoulders, hands, and finally the bat in a head-on collision with the ball. The follow-through completes the swinging pattern. Section 7, The Tactics of Hitting. When dealing with the tactics of hitting, we begin with the old adage, look for the fastball and wait for the curve. And this is true because actually what they're saying is you better be ready for the fastest pitch the pitcher has to throw because you can't make adjustments from slow to fast but you can from fast to slow. So I prepare for the fastest pitch that a pitcher can throw, and then I make adjustments from that to the slower pitches. Now this requires controlled movement. In other words, if my movement is too fast and out of control, I, I can't make the adjustment. So it's an easy early motion. In other words, I'll never, nothing goes fast until I swing the bat. I'm going to have controlled movement and hit the ball up the middle and out front. Hitting the ball up the middle will give me the strength that I need from the bat with a good bridge 
with my head and eyes right on the ball. And this is extremely important. I'm going to be staying inside the ball instead of trying to get outside the ball. Good hitters don't try to get outside the ball. Stay inside the ball with the good 90 degree bridge with the hands and the bat. The out front merely means that I have an out front target that I'm going to go out and get the ball out front, right at the front of the plate or slightly in front of it. And my, my range of vision is going to be narrow so that I can, I'll see it and I'll have the greatest resistance. Disarming the fastball then is just exactly what I'm doing. I am not letting that pitcher attack me with the fastball. I'm going to go out and get that ball, but I'm going to go out and get it in a particular controlled way with the easy approach. Early approach and easy. Never rushed. A good hitter never feels rushed. I want to talk some more about disarming the fastball. The hitter flows to hit the fastball out front. He must be ready in time. And the reason we talk about it so much that if he can't hit a fastball, he can't hit. So you have to be ready, and you have to go out and get that ball and be ready to hit. Now, the area hitting, seeing what you're looking for. If we're, if we're looking for a particular area and we get the ball in that area, we're much more liable to deal with this thing effectively than if we're trying to protect the entire plate. The whole premise of area hitting is that you can guard a particular part of the plate, not ridiculously small, maybe half, maybe two-thirds of the plate, much more effectively than you can protect the whole plate. You can't pull the inside pitch and go the outside pitch all on the same pitch. You've got to do one or the other. So we're going to look for areas. And then we're going to, with less than two strikes, we'll look for areas and we'll deal with the ball in that area. If the ball is not in our area, chances are we won't swing. And because I'm limiting my strike zone, I'm going to be much more effective. I'm going to have my physical motions are going to be much more compact. So the area hitting is a great idea. Looking for a pitch. Now, now we're looking for a specific pitch, a fastball, a curveball, a slider, or what have you, with a particular reason. Number one, really, is that I have a predictable pitcher. Now, he might not want to be predictable, but the fact of the matter is that he might not be able to throw more than one or two pitches for a strike, and he'll have a favorite pitch, one that's better than, than the others. And so you watch the pattern. You begin watching right away. How is he pitching? What counts is he able to throw particular pitches? And the next thing you know, you're guessing either area or if he's really predictable, you can guess pitch. If you don't get the pitch, you don't swing, pure and simple. But it's a whole lot easier to hit when you know the area and even easier to hit when you know the pitch. But don't guess if the pitcher is not predictable because that can be dangerous. You're, you're just going to be wasting your time at the plate. Another thing is never guess with two strikes. Don't guess area and don't guess pitch. Section eight, situational hitting. Situational hitting, that means hitting in particular circumstances where a job is expected to be done. And first of all, let's talk about hitting according to the count. The hitter is ahead in the count. He's, he's ahead of the pitcher. It's two and oh, it's three and one. He has a definite idea of what he wants to do. He has a very limited strike zone because he's not going to reach outside of his uh, area of strength to hit. Now, when the pitcher gets ahead, and not yet two strikes, but the pitcher is ahead, let's say he has a no balls and one strike, something, some count of that nature, the hitter doesn't want to leave a plan. He, he might enlarge his strike zone a little bit, but he doesn't want to panic because he can still hit with two strikes, but he wants to make sure that he gets a good pitch to hit. Be perfectly honest with you, fellas. If the pitcher made good pitches all the time exactly where he wanted, there wouldn't be very many hitters. They make mistakes, and they make mistakes. They don't have to be big mistakes either. But we're going to take advantage of the mistakes they make. But we don't want to go fishing. Don't go fishing just because the pitcher happens to get ahead of you a little bit. Now with two strikes, of course, we're not going to let that ball pass. We're going to go out and get that ball. The worst thing to happen is to have call strike three. We're going to attack the ball. And we're going to cover the whole strike zone the best we can. On the hit and run, this is nothing more than a play that requires the hitter to swing the bat. He must swing the bat to protect the runner who's leaving. Now, on the hit and run, you are very well prepared. In other words, you are not going to let the ball pass because you have to get wood or aluminum on that ball. 
Ironically, you should never be any more prepared to hit the ball on a hit and run than you would on any other pitch. Except you, on any other pitch, you have the privilege of checking your swing if you don't like it. That's what you call being aggressive. But on the hit and run, you see the ball, you hit it, and you get it on the ground. Scoring fly ball. Generally, when a scoring fly ball is needed, the hitter should try to go up the middle or the other way because it's easier to hit a fly ball going that direction than it is trying to pull it. And funny, most people, when they have a runner at third base, try to pull a ball and hit it real hard, and all they're doing is hitting a lot of ground balls. Pulling the ball means more ground balls. And with the runner at third base that we need to get in, we don't need a ground ball, we need a fly ball. Runner on third base, and the infield is back. The infield is now giving us a run if, if we hit the ball on the ground up the middle. So all we're doing is seeing the ball, and our job is to hit the ball on the ground up the middle. It's funny how great things happen when we're trying to do some of these things. A lot of things happen that are a lot more than we expect. But because we're isolating that to a particular job, we're much more efficient swinging the bat. Taking the pitch. I think that I can tell more about a hitter by the way he takes the pitch than just about anything else. When the hitter takes the pitch, I can tell whether he's properly prepared, and whether he has his hands back, and whether he started the, the shift of weight with the, the, the legs. So it's very valuable that you take the pitch and track the ball properly. We can tell a lot from that. After you've had a big hit, you've been a hero, you've hit the ball a long way. Remember that you have hit the ball a long way for one of several reasons, or combinations of reasons. First, the pitcher gave you a good pitch to hit. Secondly, you took a good swing, and so the long ball happened. The next time you come up, if you try to make it happen, chances are you're going to come off the ball. And by coming off the ball, you're not going to hit it as solidly. But if you try to hit the ball up the middle or the other way, I've seen a lot of great things happen then, too, because you're going to see the ball and you're going to hit it right, and maybe it'll pull itself. Who knows? Section 9, Drills. The perceptive coach will plan drills for individuals when necessary, and he'll tailor his batting practice to accommodate to the needs of individual hitters. Now, here are some specific drills. This is called a form drill, and it's a fine drill for beginners or advanced players, and it deals with the individual items involved in the swing. Now, we do this on a stop-start basis for purposes of instruction because, really, the good swing never stops. It always continues to flow. But let's begin first, bat on the hand properly. Show me the bridge. All right, bat on the shoulder next to the neck. Feet apart, bend at the waist, drop your knees, turn your knees in. Head forward, swing the pendulum. Bat back, keep moving. Ready, shift, torque, snap to a bridge, Hand under, finish your swing. Good. The fence drill is designed to show the correct swing. The hitter standing close to the fence, much closer than his arms and bat would indicate, is forced to have a tight pivot with his arms close to his body, bat lagging till the last instant. Done slow motion, it has this appearance. Stride, start the hips from underneath, the shoulders move, the bat lags, and I continue to pivot into a bridge and finish my swing. And done normal speed, should be much the same thing. Boom. I have good balance. And I don't hit the fence. If I cast my hands out, I hit the fence. The T-drill is a valuable drill to determine the pattern of the swing and to practice the pattern of the swing. It's also valuable to determine just exactly where the out front area is on various pitches, inside and out, high and low. The ball rests on a T, height is adjustable. The hitter determines width by his stance in relation to the T. This drill allows the hitter to practice the swing with many repetitions. The toss drill provides opportunity for easy evaluation of techniques. And it also gives the hitter plenty of chance for good repetition. The coach kneels to the side and front of the hitter. 
He tosses the ball to the hitter's out front area. He makes certain that the hitter is in rhythm with his toss. His hand swings back, the hitter gets back. His hand comes forward, the hitter pushes forward. The ball is released, the hitter gets his foot down. This is called a front toss drill. It gives the coach a chance to see the hitter head on. He can throw the ball in whatever part of the strike zone he chooses, and he can also change speeds. This drill can be a frightening if you use the regulation baseball, so we many times use the soft safety ball, which uh, makes it much less uh, frightening, much less dangerous, and very valuable still. The mix-it drill is a great way for players to get extra combat experience. The hitter's partner is about 50 feet away. He's well protected and throws a mix of pitches. All the partner is expected to do is slightly change speeds and planes, forcing the hitter to make adjustments. The bullpen is a great place for the hitter to practice two things, his approach and identifying pitches. Fastball. This drill helps with the rhythm and preparation of the approach. The hitter does everything except swing. Curveball. Change. It's the old pepper game drill, and it's a great drill to overlearn the essentials of hitting, particularly the part the shoulders play as they carry the hands to a bridge position. It's a daily drill that should involve no more than four people. This is the avoid the pitch drill. This shows the hitter the value of keeping his shoulders back until the very last instant. Early opening of the front shoulder leaves the hitter vulnerable, while good technique takes the fear out of hitting. When using a pitching machine, the hitter has specific practice goals in mind. The hitter does not use a machine just to play long ball or to see how hard he can hit the ball. He is concentrating on specific skills. Ideally, the pitching machine practice will be supervised by the coach. Section 10, identifying and solving problems. Coaching involves the art of identifying and solving problems. But the perceptive coach has to identify the causes and not merely the symptoms. Perhaps he sees a series of drills involving the swing, the toss, and the tee as being a solution. Or perhaps he'd go to more of the combat between the pitcher and the hitter. But whatever he does, he has to clear the hitter's mind of poor, negative images. He has to give him a real sense of hope. Because remember, a hitter without hope is helpless. Now, there's some common problems that each hitter faces, and we have some remedies for each. The tense hitter is overswinging, trying to pull, which widens the range of vision. Learn to wait while in control movement. Stay inside the ball. Don't try to pull it. Think up the middle or even the other way and relax. Learn to relax. The hitter overstrides and strides at too sharp an angle to home plate rather than straight ahead. He pulls the lead side out. He does not have an out front target. The key is to be ready early and to execute a good, sharp pivot from the back side. Your target is out front, so you're not trying to pull a ball, but you are getting the bat out front. Be quick and not hard. The hitter is trying to pull every pitch, and he's failing to keep all movement straight ahead. He's not waiting through movement in the approach. The approach is too fast and out of control. He's not identifying the pitch. Hitting a breaking ball means adjusting from a faster pitch to a slower pitch. Now, to do this, you have to keep the shoulder going in a straight line. You can't pull it out. That means trying to hit the ball up the middle and relax. The hitter is too tense. 
He desires to hit the ball too hard and too far by pulling the ball. He has a poor approach, too late, too fast, which rushes the hitter's actions. A doctor should check the hitter's eyes if he consistently swings at bad pitches or if he has trouble hitting in night games. Swinging and missing generally involves swinging too early and too hard with the hands, trying to pull the ball for, over the fence. The obvious solution is to wait through controlled movement, see the ball, hit it up the middle. Limit your goals. You don't have to hit a home run every time. Hit the ball up the middle with a line drive. Popping up is usually a sign of late preparation. The hitter's poor approach, with the lead shoulder open during the swing, causes the bat to drag. Popping up means you're ready too late. The bat drags because the lead side has to pull out early. You're not ready in time with your legs and with your body. So get ready early and know where the barrel of the bat is with respect to your mind's eye. Get it out front. Weak grounders are usually a function of an overstride which weakens the lower body. The head is committed beyond center, the hands are circling the ball, and the weight is centered over the heels. Hitting weak ground balls is generally a function of having too much weight forward. You get too much weight in front of the center of gravity. So to remedy that, keep your weight centered. Have a good sharp pivot, hit the ball out front with a good bridge. The hitter is timid. He does not really expect to swing. Taking good pitches is merely a function of not being ready to hit. Remember, the hitter has to be aggressive. Go out and get that ball. Don't let the ball attack you. You attack the ball. Lack of power is really failure to use the big muscles of the legs, trunk, and shoulders in sequence, and failure to build a strong bridge with the shoulders, arms, and bat. It also means leaking from the front side by pulling out the front knee, hip, and shoulder, rather than driving from the back side. Power comes from the ground up. Remember the sequence beginning with the feet, to the legs and hips, to the upper body, and to the bat with a good brace. If one has this, then he'll be strong. Now notice the common solutions to the problems that we've just talked about. Relaxation, a good early approach, a good pivot with a good base, and a good bridge. What we're looking for really is awareness rather than conscious control. Section 11, typical questions and answers regarding the hitting technique. Let me take this time to answer some of the questions most frequently asked during my 29 years of coaching. Waiting is not delaying preparation, but is actually holding the final act of the swing until the last split second. The natural arc of the swing must be down to begin, level at contact, and up to finish. The hands are last in the progression of feet, knees, hips, trunk, and shoulders. Although a short stride is ideal, there have been some tremendously strong individuals who have hit well with a long stride. A hitch after the release of the ball is bad, but as an early means of preparation, it is something that many great hitters have done. By staying inside the ball, the knob of the bat is kept between the hitter's chest and the flight of the ball. This allows for balance, quickness, and adjustments to the variety of pitches. I've enjoyed spending this time with you and hope the things that we have shared will prove to be valuable to coaches and players.